Hey everybody, what's going on and welcome to Guns N' Roses Central. And I've done some videos on Velvet Revolver. I talked about their induction of Van Halen into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2007. I talked about how Scott Wallen got fired from the band. But today I want to talk about how drugs, alcohol, and runaway egos almost tore the band apart after their first album, Contraband, came out. So Contraband, the recording of that album seemed like it was relatively straightforward. But once the band got on the road things really started to fall apart and in 2006 that's when everything reached a peak. It's a lot of the band members with the exception of Dave Kushner fell off the wagon and went in different directions and that's what I want to talk about today. Now here's a clip of Duff, Slash and Matt talking about that time in Velvet Revolver as well as Dave Kushner. We flew out to New York to master the record and when the master record was finished we were uh, at Sterling Sound and high up on a shelf somewhere in the studio there was an unopened bottle of Jack Daniels and so I fell off the wagon that night but I remember I was the first one that fell off and everyone kind of looked at me like I was the Antichrist you know it's like this sucks I remember this is the fucking most boring shit I'd go backstage and they'd be sitting there but these guys would be reading books and shit I'm like what what the fuck just happened to rock and roll you know really is this how we're gonna do this You'll get an extended adolescence by being a musician that's working, period. So there's just no rules, really. One of my lowest bottoms during that, and I allowed it. I watched it happen, and I allowed myself to go down that path. I actually was very uh, aware of it and conscious of it, and just kept following, to going down that rabbit hole to see where it was going to lead. And when I finally got to the bottom, I was like, you know what? After all these years and this and that and the other, this sucks. You know, by the end of 2005, everybody was pretty fucked up on something. It was like living the old life again, you know? So Slash was drinking, I was, I was getting drunk and doing my share of drugs. But Duff had gone into this sneaky pill-popping thing. I think in his mind, pills would be okay. That won't affect my pancreas, right? I remember the moment thinking about uh, the pills in my backpack, and I knew I knew the moment I thought about it, like, you're in trouble. I'm working a game. And, and Dave, you know, it's like, dude, what's going on with you? And, um, you know, I lied to him. That's what you do. I'm like, dude, what, what did you take today? He's like, oh, I just took some blah, 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 and he bullshitted. You're fucking off the wagon, dude. Xanax is in the same family, actually, as alcohol. It's a benzodiazepine which is the same feeling you get when you drink. In a, in a week's time, I was at 22 milligrams, so 22 of those pills a day. He just was like, everything was slow motion. I just, I, I knew at that point, like, okay, you're taking pills again, and you're not just taking them to fly. When I knew he was in trouble, so I found him on the tour bus, passed out on the toilet in the tour bus. And uh, he was in there for like fucking two hours. Now in Slash's book, he details a lot of what happened after he got off the road with Contraband. And he said, it wasn't easy on Perla or myself when I got home. I started drinking wine, a lot of wine on tour, and she'd watch me slip into my old ways once again. Now for whatever reason, when she came to visit me on tour, I chose that day to sit at the bar drinking under the guise of basically waiting there for her. All that I accomplished was getting myself smashed to the point that I was useless when she finally arrived. I'd say hello and go pass out, so we had some issues to deal with. Now, it wasn't just the drugs that almost ruined Velvet Revolver, but it was also management decisions, not just by the band as a whole, but also by some certain members. So according to Slash's book, he said when Velvet Revolver got signed, got our album together, and set out to prepare, basically prepare a tour, we underwent a change in management that I didn't agree with it at all. That eventually led me to find my own manager separate from the band. In theory, that sounded like a logical solution to me. But all that did in reality was alienate me from the rest of the guys and cause a great de degree of animosity amongst us and amongst the management teams whenever a business arrangement came up. This situation added an extra level of stress that two years on the road did nothing but escalate. The tension never affected our chemistry on stage or creatively, but on a day-to-day -day interpersonal level, things were touchy, and basically by the end of the tour, um, everyone was at one another's throats. I stand by my decision, but I understand now that it made me a pain in the ass to the rest of the band. 
it wasn't just the drugs and the management stuff either. They had to throw in another wrench, and that was Axel Rose. So Slash said it was around this time that Axel chose to send out a press release that did nothing but add fuel to the fire, and it's been widely documented, so I won't do it justice by getting into all of it. But in short, Axel released a statement claiming that I'd come by his house extremely coherent early one morning to ask him to please settle the lawsuit between us that had been ongoing for years at that point. It's also claimed that he and I talked for a while and that I had nothing but disparaging comments to make about Scott Wallen and everyone else in the band. The truth is, I haven't spoken a word to Axel personally since I left the band in 1996. I did go by his house one night, but I was drunk, Perla wasn't, and she was driving. I walked up to the door and delivered a note that read something like, let's work this out, call me, slash. But I didn't give it to Axel, I gave it to his assistant. In any case, Axel released a statement, and it was a big deal in the press because it was the first time that Axel had gone public with his opinion about me, the lawsuit, or anything else like that. And as I've said, this incident was widely reported in the press and on the internet. Now anyone else who is interested can go read all about it if they choose to do so. The fact of the matter is this incident and the resulting negative effect it had on Velvet Revolver was extremely unsettling to me, and I can barely even talk about it still, let alone recreate it in detail here. I thought I was going to see everything I just finally gotten together fall apart. Now on top of that, Scott Wallen released his own statement belittling Axel. And in 2006, almost on April Fool's Day, it almost seemed like a joke, but there was a rumor that Slash had quit Velvet Revolver, removed his gear from the studio where they were rehearsing, and was rejoining Guns N' Roses. So according to the article, Slash spent time at a Los Angeles recording studio on March 31st, 2006, laying down a guest guitar solo on an album from an up-and-coming female singer that was being produced by one-time GNR producer Mike Klink. So Slash reportedly responded that as far as he knew, he was still in the band despite rumors to the contrary. Now as previously reported, rumors of trouble in the Velvet Revolver camp have been swirling around the group for the past few months, with several reports suggesting that the much of the strife between Slash and the rest of the camp stems from Slash's wife Perla's alleged involvement in the band's business affairs. The situation allegedly came to a head the previous week after an attempt was made by attorneys to mediate the matters related to the lawsuits filed by Slash, as well as Duff McKagan against GNR from and Axl Rose over the rights to the old songs, and the rumors continued to gain strength a few days later when unconfirmed reports Report surface that Slash had picked up his gear from Velvet Revolver's rehearsal studios after allegedly announcing he was leaving the group. Now, even Axel Rose's representative had to put out a statement shooting down persistent rumors that former GNR member Slash, Izzy, and Duff were in talks with Rose about taking part in a reunion tour this summer. Now, not only was there one issue with Velvet Revolver and the band members, but there was also an issue brewing between Slash and his second wife, Perla. So Slash in his book talked about how he had injured himself in the gym. He had torn his rotator cuff working out and he went to see the doctor and, the and basically the doctor prescribed him painkillers and he knew damn well what Vicodin was and the effect that it had on Slash. But in the form of a prescription from a doctor, it seemed okay and actually necessary. I took the Vicodin as instructed one every four hours and it soon became two every four hours, then one every hour, then one every 15 minutes and that's just the way it works for me. Not only was my band situation in jeopardy, Perla and I were at odds like never before. I was heading one way with Vicodin, and she was heading another way. After the birth of our second son, Perla wanted to lose all the weight that she'd gained having children, and in doing so, she got addicted to prescription diet pills. Now, diet pills are basically a gourmet form of speed, and she'd been taking them long enough indiscriminately that it had altered her personality, and she was already a super attentive, super sort of person who was already a few steps ahead of me. Adding speed of any kind to that equation accentuated those traits to the point that she became too intense for me to deal with. And things had gotten so bad that at one point there was press reports that Slash and, and Perla had divorced in 2006, even though those didn't turn out to be true. Now, Slash was on Howard Stern's show back in 2012, and he talked about when he finally decided to get sober in 2006, and it was really the last good run he had when it came to his addictions. We canceled... Um... Australia for the second time. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of gives it. Have you seen him since? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and uh, at that moment, and it was uh, to go to rehab, one of many, 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 many stints at rehab. Yeah. And it Does was rehab right not after work? a show. Just depends. You know, it's like anything else. It depends on how committed you are when you go in. Wor rehab worked for you, right? Yeah, it worked for me, but it took me a long. I, I refused to go to rehab until I finally decided I wanted to get clean. And and I needed a place to go where right. nobody was going to bug me, so I could just get my shit together. You stopped yeah. smoking cigarettes too, right? Yeah. But that's wow. how, that's probably more. Di was that what's what's more difficult to get off heroin or or uh, or Cigarette. uh, cigarettes? A cigarettes is an ongoing thing that never goes away. Oh yeah. And I I still I have nicotine supplements, so I'm not. 
Uh, oh, you do. But you yeah. have, when's the last time you physically it's, smoked it's been, a cigarette? It's been more than three years. Wow, wow. good for you. Yeah. So yeah. I saw my moments, like certain things trigger it, and you're like, ooh, that looks good. Yeah. but That's a tough one to break. Yeah, it's hard. It is harder than heroin, right? Uh, I mean, it's not physically as, as, as uh, stressful. Is yeah. heroin is, but or alcohol, which is the worst one as far as I'm concerned. Is because it? coming but, off alcohol, you get the DTs. Is yeah, that the tough part? Yeah. And yeah. you just rather take a drink than experience. I mean, that's that. why I used to drink 24 7 because I always I, I learned way early on if you get up in the morning with a hangover, you can just drink it away and did that for 25 years. No, did you ever? Geez. Did you ever get to the root of why you drank? Did you ever sort of get into rehab and really do that hard work and say? Um, Man, uh, there's something going on here. With well, me. yeah, but you know, it's a long conversation. I think, but a lot of it, you know, it was all fun and games for the longest time. But right. it wasn't until um, I'd say in the '90s when it became a necessity, and it became that crutch to sort of get you through. Mm -hmm. Which is one of the reasons why I don't ever want to go back into that situation because it was literally like the 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 peacekeeper, the the thing that uh, pacified you to get through those three years of touring with those last the last guns things thanks for watching guys that does it for today's video let me know your thoughts in the comment section below and were you guys following the velvet revolver drama back in 2006 put your comments down below and make sure you hit the like button and subscribe for the latest guns and roses news and more cool true stories just like this and go check us out at gnrcentral.com for the latest and greatest news ticker hey, this is